So welcome to our third session in this series. And this session is entitled Exodus and Awakening. And in this, this time together, we hope to consider two of the most important, the most crucial, the most central themes in Christian spiritual life, and indeed in all life, and especially in gay life. And they're the themes of exodus, of leaving, of liberation, of coming out in some sense, and the theme of coming alive, of awakening. So before we begin, let's just take a moment of silence together. And as, as I speak, I'm aware that, again, although we're separate in time and space, part of our liberation, part of our freedom, is to realize that in truth there is no separation. So let's be quiet and silent together for a moment and let the Spirit speak in our hearts. And may the light and the love of the Holy Spirit be in our heart and on our lips. Amen. This theme of exodus, this theme of waking up and of moving out, is at the very heart of the spiritual life and of the Christian understanding of what it means to come alive. And as always, whenever we talk about anything to do with coming into maturity as a Christian, we see things in terms of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Death and resurrection of Jesus always has to be the central motif, the central paradigm, the central way we understand who we are and who we're coming to be as Christians, as human beings. At the same time, from the earliest times in the church's history, there's been a need to, to tell stories, to find ways of reflecting or enfleshing the death and resurrection of Christ. What does it mean to live this out in a real life, in a, in a human life? And to find these stories, one of the first places that the early Christians looked was the Old Testament, which makes sense since most of these people were originally Hebrews. And these were the great stories of their childhood, of their youth, of their mature lives, the great stories which had led them to some sense of being God's people. And the central story in, in the whole of the Old Testament, the central story for Israel, of course, is always the Exodus, the liberation from Egypt. And uh, in a sense, one of the crucial things about Exodus is that Jews were always asked to remember that God freed them from Egypt. It was not just their ancestors 2,000 years ago, but rather you were brought out of Egypt. And similarly for us, the, the themes we talk about, whether it's Exodus or the death and resurrection of Christ, are meaningless unless they take flesh in our lives and in our bodies. There's no point in having you know, a notional assent to them or the assent of faith if they're not lived out. One of the great uh, mystics of the Western tradition, Meister Eckhart, once said, what good is it to me if the Virgin Mary gave birth to Christ 2,000 years ago? if she does not also give birth to Christ in me, in my time, in my life, in my space. And with that theme in mind that we need to enflesh these stories in our lives, we go forward. When we look at the story of Exodus, we find that it begins with the call of God. Everything in scripture, everything in, in the movement of the spiritual life is fundamentally God's initiative. And this call which comes to the people of, of Israel living in slavery in Egypt harks back to an earlier call that we need to look at briefly first. And that's the call of Abraham, which is the great paradigm for any call in, in Judeo-Christian history. And the call of, call of Abraham is addressed to this man who was then Abram, who was not a Hebrew, who was not uh, one of the people of Yahweh. They didn't really exist any uh, yet. And suddenly this call came to him when he was quite old, living an ordinary life like the people around him, quite a prosperous life. And the call was this. It comes from Genesis 12. Yahweh said to Abram, Leave your country, your family, and your father's house, for the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, 
I will bless you and make your name so famous that it will be used as a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. All the tribes of the earth shall bless themselves by you. So Abram went, as Yahweh told him. So this beautiful, simple example of the call has been used over and over again through the centuries and continuing into our day as the seminal call which leads us forward. And the call, if you'll notice, is leave. Leave. Get out. Go. Leave your family. Leave your country. Leave your father's house for the land that I will show you. And remember that Abram was living quite a successful life with lands and tribes and servants and, and sheep and goats, quite prosperous for his time. And he was asked to leave and move out without maps, without details. Yahweh did not go on to say and, and go here and then go there and turn left down by the 7-Eleven and take a right by the bridge. It was just leave. And it reminds me of something the poet Machado said, Traveller, there is no path. Paths are made by walking. So the call is to walk, to leave, to move, to get out and to go with a simple trust that somehow, in some way, the promise will be fulfilled. We see this too in the Exodus, and we'll talk in more detail a little later, when the people leave Egypt to enter the wilderness with no maps and no guides except Moses who didn't really know where he was going himself just trusting that somehow God was leading them. And we also see it in a very strange group of, of wild men in the early centuries of the church's history and women too I might add. We tend to always think of, of these particular people as being men but many of them were not. They were women who did the same, same thing, moved the same way. And these were the desert monks, desert nuns and just as we look to the Old Testament for our stories of how to enflesh the death and resurrection of Christ, to reclaim these stories as our own, we can also look to the great stories of, of Christian tradition, of Christian history, and reclaim them as our own as well. Since liberation is not something that just happens to us, it's been happening down through the centuries to others, and we can learn from them. Now these people lived in about the 3rd and 4th centuries, probably more the 4th century, at a time when the church, Christianity, was becoming more and more popular, more and more the thing. It was becoming the state religion. And gradually it was moving from a situation where if you were Christian, your life was at stake, to a situation where if you wanted to get on, if you wanted to particularly get on in politics, you needed to be a Christian. It's starting to sound familiar, isn't it? Um, you needed to be a Christian, uh, even nominally, just to be able to use the name um, that was the way you would make it. It was also a society that was crumbling, its structures, its sense of meaning, its moral codes, its sense of values were falling apart. It was under attack from uh, barbarian tribes, as they were termed then, and it was literally beginning to collapse. And these, these men and women left the cities, went out into the desert and began to live um, lives of silence and prayer and a lot of harsh penance, um, often very much alone, seeking a purer, deeper kind of Christianity. And often they, um, they left with a sense of urgency, as if the world around, around them was somehow seducing them into a kind of slavery, as if to stay would in some ways put their life at stake. And so often they really fled, it was a fleeing of the cities and of this very bourgeois kind of Christianity that had become you know, the state thing, the way to get on in life, to find what they saw as the martyrdom of the desert, that just as the martyrs put their lives on the line, so these people wanted to put their lives on the line too. They wanted that kind of Christianity, as Jesus put his life on the line. So they fled a very particular kind of a world, a very, very corrupt, compromised kind of a world that was losing its way. It reminds me too, for example, of Francis of Assisi in the uh, 13th century. Again, uh, uh, quite a, a rich, um, successful young man who had a wonderful career in front of him. 
And Francis too left, left all of that and became a beggar. And went out from the city to live in the forests and in caves and gradually found a new way of being Christian which has revitalised and inspired people for the last 800 years and is still inspiring people today. That's the power of this call to leave. It inspires people down the centuries. It's not just for oneself. And when I talk about people leaving, people fleeing, people leaving their father's house, leaving their country for another land, I think about gay people and the very, very many gay people who in very literal senses have left their father's house, their towns, their states, their countries, to, an, to another land, to find another place where they can in some sense be themselves, where we can be ourselves. The classic stories, for example, of people fleeing places like the Midwest in the United States to go to, to San Francisco or to New York or to Amsterdam or maybe to London or maybe to Sydney. People fleeing often tiny rural towns hoping that in the cities they might find a different freedom, a different way of being themselves. And often there, there also is this sense of urgency of our lives being at stake, or certainly our sanity being at stake. And, and the, the impulse from within driving us, get out, leave. The only way to find life is, is to leave and find freedom somewhere else. And in a sense, when I look at the kind of world that gay people are leaving when they do this. I think of the world the monks left. You know, this term world, it, it's a, a difficult one because so often the world and, and the spirit have been opposed to each other. And that's not true, of course. I mean, everything is, is saturated with spirit. When world is used in this sense, it brings a very particular kind of human reality. A human reality which is very much enslaved to greed, to rampant ambition, to exploitation of people, of the earth, of oneself, of religion, subjecting everything to gods of mammon, money, um, power, prestige, the status quo, the structures that uh, uplift some and enslave the many. That's the kind of world we're talking about that demands people be a certain way so that things can be a certain way for certain people and you get on by becoming one of those people and obeying their rules. And everyone else is at the bottom as kind of serfs to support the structure. That's what's meant by leaving the world in this context. Maybe it's not such a bad kind of world to leave. And again, I really believe that whether we're looking at Abraham or the desert monks or gay people in our time, we are looking at the call of the divine lover the call of God, the call of the Spirit, however we want to image that reality, coming up from within us and impelling us to move, not to stay in our so-called security, but to get out. And it's God's initiative, not our own. I firmly believe that. We respond to a call. It's also a call to find my people, to find a place of belonging. And here I'm aware of how often we feel that we have no people, we are no people. And it's in this experience that we become a people, as we'll see happen to Israel. Always the issue is freedom, freedom, freedom. There is nothing that is more at the heart of what Christian life is about than freedom. And so, of course, it, it's a great pain to me, and I'm sure to many of us, to see what is done in the name of Christianity right through the centuries, but particularly in our time, the call is, is one of freedom. Let's not have that call polluted, distorted, or taken away from us. So, leave and let go. I'd like to turn now to Moses, to the great story of the Exodus, which is, is the theme of this, uh, this particular session. Let's just recall the situation for a moment for those of us who perhaps haven't read the book of Exodus for quite some time. It's probably quite a few of us. We have a situation where uh, the people of Israel, um, in a sense the Hebrews, who were not a very specific group of people in some ways at this period. They were a very motley group of slaves and oppressed people, the Habiru, who lived in Egypt and had been there for a long time, perhaps captured in the desert, wandering nomads 
taken into slavery and had been there for a long time, probably some hundreds of years. And gradually the oppression gets worse and worse. Um, they're pressed into slavery, building the great cities, maybe the pyramids. Whether this happened historically, we're not sure, but certainly this is the great story. And finally, the oppression gets, gets particularly acute because they're breeding at a great rate, and the Egyptians are frightened that they will overtake them in numbers. So they begin to throw their firstborn sons into the Nile River. And it's at this point, when the oppression has become this acute, that God sends Moses, calls Moses, and then sends Moses. And Moses, who is himself a Hebrew, um, comes back into the, the um, land of Egypt after a time of purification in the desert, encountering God. And his great call to the gods of Egypt and to the Pharaoh of Egypt is, let my people go. So we have leave and we have let my people go. So Moses comes in to really say two things. One, my people are in slavery. And two, let them go. And both of these things are really crucial. The first part is to rec recognize and to realize when we are in slavery. And this is probably the most crucial moment in, in the life and the growth of a gay and lesbian person. To realize what is being done to us, what has been built into our bones almost, from often the time before we were born even. The messages, the um, conditioning, the programming, the oppression has gone on, right from the sort of images and dreams that our mother and father may have had when we were in the womb, that we would be a certain way, that our lives would go along certain paths. And, and that has become part of who we are. At the same time, as we have started to realize or suspect or fear that maybe we are not that way. And for 15, 20, 25, 30, 45, 50, 60 years sometimes, we have oppressed and kept down who we are because of what has been done to us, what has been told to us. As we've grown, we've started to realize this is not just a way of saying this is the way you should be. It's a way of saying you better be this or your life is at stake. Your life, your sanity, your jobs, your future, your career, um, your prosperity, your physical well-being, your respect, your prestige in, in the culture, and again, very literally in many cases, your life. If you are not this way, if you don't abide by these rules and behave in this way, your life is not only not going to be worth living, you may not have a life. And we pick this up very, very quickly, very early. I listened to my little nieces and nephews who are, you know, seven or eight back in Australia. And uh, I don't know if it's happening here, but gay has become a term to say, oh, that's really stupid, or that sucks, or that's really dumb. They'll say, oh, gee, that's gay. And when I pull them up on it, they say, oh, no, we don't mean anything. We don't mean it's bad to be gay. But this is the word that's being used, you know, even in 1994. You know, now all this stuff, we know this, all this stuff goes into us right from the time we begin to understand what speech means, or even just to pick up what tones mean, and, and then to wonder, could I be this? Might this be me? I think of my mother at times saying things about queers. You know, I, I, I confess I still find that word a little, little difficult because of the way it was used. And, and the kind of bewilderment, not knowing what she meant, but the kind of subtle feeling, maybe she's talking about me. And sometimes she was a little more specific or hinted at it a little more strongly as this was not a thing to be. You know, we take all, in all this stuff and we start to become or pretend or act as if we are what the society demands we be. So we become enslaved to our families. We become enslaved very much to the society around us that does not want us to be who we are does not want anything to change. And if we become who we are, brother, sister, things are going to change. We become enslaved to the church, which in its most gracious moments tells us it's okay to be who we are as long as we don't act on it. Like don't live, don't breathe, don't have a body, don't have a sexuality, just kind of be a condition, be an orientation, don't be a person. 
And so often we take this on and we struggle. I mean, just last night I was talking to a man of 50, a beautiful, wise um, man who practices yoga as a yoga teacher, but who grew up in a very traditional black gospel oriented family. And in jest, he said, you know, well, who knows? You know, what if the God, you know, at the end of our lives turns out to be the God of hellfire and maybe that's where we're all going. Ha ha. It's still there. It's still there inside us. This slavery is not something that's thrown off easily. So we become enslaved to the church. Often we serve the church. I mean, I often wish that all gay people in the church would strike for three days. And I mean all churches, all denominations, would go on strike for three days and watch the place fall apart. Because we make the thing run. You know, as, as someone from the Catholic tradition, I certainly know that that's true. I also know it's true in the Episcopal Church. And I'm sure it's true in very many ways for all the other denominations as well. That we are often the people who bring a deep sense of the spiritual, a deep commitment, a deep creativity, a deep self-giving, a deep devotion to the church. And we accept the slavery ourselves. We become enslaved to the church. We also become enslaved to myself. And this is more, slightly more subtle and more complicated because this is the kind of slavery that that in our spiritual tradition we talk about the most. It's a slavery to the values of the world we talked about. A slave, a slave to comfort, security, to getting on, um, to being seen as okay to other people's opinions. Um, a slave to my own sense of who I am, that I have a certain role in society. I think of that wonderful scene in, in um, Angels in America where Roy Cohn basically says, um, you know, he's just been told he has AIDS by his doctor and, and, the, and the doctor implies he may be a homosexual and Rory Cohn says that homosexuals are people who have no clout I have clout therefore I, can, I cannot be a homosexual therefore I cannot have AIDS this sense of self I have clout therefore I can't be one of these people denying who I am absolutely so totally that he oppressed other people who were the same tribe, because he couldn't face the slavery within himself. He had sold himself into slavery. And this is often the hardest slavery to really address. Now these combined slaveries, these combined slave masters of family, of society, of church, and of ourselves, can not only you know, attack us individually or enslave us individually, they can present this incredibly united front so that our family is saying the same thing, our society is saying the same thing, our church is saying the same thing, and most of ourselves, our superego, if you like, is saying the same thing. And there is this poor, apparently weak little voice inside saying, I don't think so. I don't really think so. It's like this, this little boy up the back, little girl up the back of the class, kind of tentatively putting up the hand saying, um, excuse me, bullshit. This is not true. And that frightened, often fragile little voice, that is the voice of freedom. That is the voice that hears the call of the Holy Spirit to come out, to leave, to let my people go. That is the voice we have to look for. That is the voice we have to listen to. That's the, the still, small voice, which is the voice of God. Not in the earthquake or in the storm or in the fire, as the prophet Elijah experienced it, but in the still small voice, which says, this isn't it, this is not it, move. Freedom awaits you, come, come out, come forward. And this, 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 this command of God, it's not just an invitation of let my people go, is addressed in, in the um, scriptures to the Pharaoh, but it's also addressed to the gods of Egypt. Yahweh says again and again, I will make judgment, I'll pass judgment on all the gods of Egypt and, and I will conquer the gods of Egypt. So these are the gods that I've spoken of. These are the gods of this kind of comfort, this kind of security, this kind of ambition, this kind of structural enslavement that wants nothing to change, that wants some people to rise and some people to support them by their lives, by their oppression, by their slavery. These gods are the gods that the God, the one, 
wants to pass judgment on and is saying, let my people go. But these gods are, as I say, they're not just outside us, they're also inside us. And before my people are going to be let go, there's going to be a mighty struggle that goes on here. It's not going to be an easy process. And, you know, I say this um, also to gain least in people who have come out, that I'm sure, you know, we all realise these gods don't let go that easily. You know, they're in our guts, folks, and, and they're going to keep up the battle as long as they can. So we have this wonderful story in the scripture. Um, as these gods feel their sense of power and control being threatened, as they sense judgment being passed on them, that in some sense our freedom says that they're full of shit, that their bluff is called. We have the story of the ten plagues, that Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. So Yahweh sent ten plagues, really terrible plagues of, of frogs and lice and, and all kinds of things. The waters turned to blood and night turned to darkness and all sorts of horrible things happened. And after each plague, Moses went back to Pharaoh and said, well, are you going to let them go now? And Pharaoh would say, no, 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 no. So what I see this is, is this, this tussle, this tussle. We start to feel the struggle in our guts, in, 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 in our bones. We start to feel the slavery. We start to feel the oppression. And there's movements to, to get out, to move towards freedom. But no, 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 no. The gods aren't going to let us go yet. Our family says, yeah, well, well, well just, just, just keep it quiet. Just, just don't, don't tell the neighbours. Just, just don't make a fuss. Our friends say, well, yeah, we understand, but, you know, don't tell anybody at work. I mean, you know, don't do anything foolish. Our church says, well, yeah, but, you know, don't have sex. And, and, and don't tell anyone in the church around you that you're, you know, like that, you know. Our society says, well, you know, yes, but no marriage. You know, don't, don't, don't demonstrate in the streets. You know, just, just, just go to work and be quiet and be like everyone else. And don't do anything in the streets and frighten the horses, you know, and it'll be okay. There's this, this tussle and, and this voice inside gets stronger saying, I've got to be free. I've got to be free. This isn't it. This isn't it. So I see this as the ten plagues. And I have to say this, there's this wonderful part of us, well, wonderful, dreadful part of us. It's, I think of um, Murder in the Cathedral, a wonderful play by T.S. Eliot, where, um, based on the true story of Thomas Beckett in the 12th century, and he was an archbishop, long story, had a major fight with the king. Um, and uh, he's been in exile in France, and he's coming back to London. And the people know there is going to be trouble, big trouble. And in fact, Thomas ends up being stabbed to death by the king's knights in his own cathedral. Well, the people have some sense of this. And when he's coming back, he's their archbishop. They're in the streets saying, um, Thomas Archbishop, go back to France. We have lived these seven years or so living and partly living. Living and partly living. And there have been births and deaths and marriages and, and plagues and famines, but we've gone on living, living and partly living. We do not want anything to happen. And that's the cry of these gods within us. We do not want anything to happen. We don't want anything to change. It's been okay. Well, we've been living, living and partly living, but living. We've gotten by. Just keep it quiet. These are the gods that are being challenged. Now, part of the problem, too, is not just these gods not wanting to let us go. It's the fear of the wilderness, the sense that on the other side of leaving, on the other side of letting go, what is there? What is there if we do come out? Freedom? What's it going to look like? What's it going to taste like? What will happen? My God, what will happen? How will I make a living? How will everyone react? There's this need to know what the geography will look like of this new land. And into the midst of that, there is the voice of God saying, trust me, the land I will show you. Trust me, come out, come forward, leave. It's scary. The cost is very great. 
In the contemplative life, in the spiritual life, it's very great. The monks who left their homes and went into the desert lived very, very poor and, and rough lives, very often lonely lives. In, in the gay movement, in gay moving out, in moving out into freedom as gay and lesbian persons, we know the costs can be enormous. It's important that we take this seriously. I mean, not everyone lives in the Castro, thank God. Um, even those who do know that the cost is still very, very real. In other places in the world, it can be far more devastating. So it gives us pause. It's wise to wait and to look and to be cautious and to you know, smell the change and smell the possibilities and be aware of our fears. Don't move until the time is right. So the struggle goes on. What finally moves us? What finally gets us out? In Exodus, it's the death of the firstborn. That finally, I mean, terrible story in some ways. I mean, finally, you know, Yahweh, at wit's end, strikes down the firstborn son of all of the Egyptians. And that forces Pharaoh to say, get the hell out of here. Get these people out of here. And they leave, so he lets them go. What is this death? What is this death? What, how can we interpret this? This is what allows the Exodus to take place in the story. If we're going to make the story ours, how, how, do we, how do we understand this? Not easy. I think it's the death of the future. The death of the future. Your firstborn son, especially in that kind of a society, was the inheritor. Okay? He was the guarantee of you know, uh, the clan, the, the, the family continuing, carrying on the genetic code, we'd say now. But certainly he was the promise for the future. His death is the death of the future. I think what moves us out is the death of the future. With the monks, they started to realize that the society that they were living in was killing them. That although it promised lots of goodies, um, quite a, a lot of these people were quite secure, quite well-off people. They were often educated people who fled the cities into these harsh Syrian deserts to live these extraordinary lives. And I might add, to leave us extraordinary wisdom in the mystical tradition. They could have had very comfortable lives many, in many, many cases. But there was this sense that there is no life for me here anymore. This is killing me. The future, as I understood it, has, has died. It's dead. I have to get out and find some other possibility. It's sort of like I can't stay in the tension any longer. I've got to get out. This is killing me. For gay Christians, I think the death of the firstborn is the death of the church. It's the realization there is no future for me in this community. Now, I don't necessarily mean that in an absolutely literal sense, because in the true community, the true people of God, the true church, is my true home. But in this community, in this version, in this structured version of, of the church, this thing that calls itself church and often isn't, this group of people, this institution that I have often given so much of my life and so much of my heart and soul to, there is no life for me. There is no future for me anymore. And so the church dies. And the pain is so great that it forces me out the gates, through the waters, and on the journey. That's the death of the firstborn, I think, for a gay Christian. And I can't think of anything that is much more painful. Because as I say, this is like our flesh and blood. This is like our bones. This is who we are. This is our heart. And in some sense, to follow the call of God, to follow the call of the divine lover to freedom, we have to leave the very community that first led us into some awareness of God and of God's love. Now that's an intensely painful and challenging thing to do. I think of, of cases, for example, in, in O'Neill and Ritter's wonderful book, Coming Out Within, where people suddenly realized, you know, one case of, of a, a sister who had worked all her life in the church, and one Sunday listening to a sermon 
she realized, she'd come to realize she was lesbian. She suddenly realized, listening to this man up there, that there was no place for her as a woman and certainly as a lesbian. That this community she had devoted her life to did not want her as she was. I remember for myself the first time I sat in a church and realized this institution that I have given so much of my life to does not want me to go to the table, does not want me to receive the Eucharist. And not only that, but most of the actual people in this church, would, if they knew who I was, they wouldn't want me to go to the table either. So there's a kind of a death and one is forced to move. This journey um, is also often uh, symbolized as the second journey, as the journey that often happens, say, in midlife for a lot of people. Jung talks about this a lot, that we, we reach a point in our lives where we realize the old story can't do it anymore. It falls apart. And sometimes it's, it's, it's losing a job or becoming sick or having a divorce, um, death of a child, death of a spouse, all kinds of things that, that are forced on one. We don't choose this. The journey is too painful. We have too much invested in the status quo. We don't just decide, oh, I think I'll you know, live a totally different life from today. You know, this is forced onto us. But given that, that it is, we later realize the gift and the blessing that this, this what seemed like a catastrophe at the time, um, has been. And for a lot of people, this experience of the death of the future, when they realize they're gay and lesbian, um, later only comes to be seen as a great gift, a great call to freedom. But I'd, I'd still say it's not necessarily something we choose. In this context, AIDS has been very much um, a call onto this journey for a lot of people. Both those who've had AIDS or have AIDS and those who minister, care for people with AIDS, and also people with HIV. The realization that you know, life is different now, the realization of mortality, the realization of one's exile, one's stigma in society, the realization that the gods of gay culture aren't going to support one very much through this journey, the realization just that you know, life is limited, forces people onto a different kind of journey this too is an exodus. This too is an exodus. So I see AIDS with all its horror as in some ways a gift as well, as every tragedy, every turning point can be. Sometimes the real exodus comes only after we have, in a sense, come out, whether that's coming out within or outside or both. And I'll talk a little bit, bit about that in a moment. It comes afterwards when we start to share the story with other people and we start to realize what we've done. We start to see their reactions and, and feel their estrangement, their, oh, ah, mm-hmm, you sure? And we start to realize, oh my God, I've just come out. I've just moved. I've just left. I've just let my people go. They didn't know quite what I was doing. And sometimes it's that pain and that sense of, of rejection, of estrangement, which really is the exodus for us. In any case, somewhere, in some way, the gods begin to let us go. The gods of, of Israel, the gods of Egypt, begin to let us go. We begin to respond to the call to leave. We begin to move out. And in the story, you may be wondering what happened in Exodus, those of us who don't know it that well or haven't seen Cecil B. DeMille for some time. Um, what happens next is that the people are led out by a, a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud by day. Beautiful images. In this journey that we make, I see them as passion, fire. Our passion leads us for it, forward. And the pillar of cloud is a sense of mystery, of unknown and of new possibilities that that leads us forward, that they are our guiding points as we move out of the land of slavery. They also go through the waters. They go through the waters. They get to the, the Reed Sea or the Red Sea. I think, how the hell are we going to get through this? And they're being pursued by 
Pharaoh and his chariots, who just changes his mind um, at the last minute and chases them. These gods, as I say, don't want to let us go. They don't. They want slaves. They want slaves to keep making the bricks to build the cities. You know, We've been doing that all our lives. Hey, let's take a break. Let's do it differently. But the gods don't want to let us go. So they give chase. And the people are between the sea and, and Pharaoh. And Moses stretches out his hand, and the, the waters part, and they go through. And uh, Pharaoh's and his chariots chase them, and the people get through, and Moses stretches out his hand, and the waters flow back, and they're all drowned. Like a lot of stories in the Old Testament, this one is a little bit gory. It's still a good story. Um, and the people are free on the other side of the water. I thought, what, what does this say? What is this about for us in our exodus? And I can only speak personally, I suppose. I think this is, is sort of like that point you get to when you think, this is not going to work. I've blown it. I've come out. How the hell am I going to get through this? Somehow the, the territory looks impassable. It looks like there is no way through, no way to a new kind of life. And somehow, in some way, we get through the waters. Maybe it's just with the help of some friends, reading, reading the right book, saying the right prayer, having some sense that it's OK, it's all right, it's going to be all right. Just a word of encouragement from someone. Sometimes it's going to a new place and finding that there is a new way of being here. Sometimes it's finding a group of people who can be a community for us. But always it seems to me there is a sense that I'm not going to get through it, and we do. And that getting through it are the waters parting and us going through. And, and somehow we find ourselves on the other shore. And we look back and we think, how the hell did I ever live back there? How did I ever live back there? From the other side, it looks like that was not life at all. And, and of course the waters parted. But from this side, my God, what the hell do I do now? Trust and go forward. And the waters will part. That's our trust. That's our trust. That's our call. That's the promise that we will be led where there is no path, where it seems impossible to go. So we pass through the waters and we come to the other side. And here there is a great and solemn joy. And if there isn't, the damn ought to be. And if there isn't, we better ask ourselves what the hell is going on. Not that everything's happy, happy, happy. There is a great and solemn joy. And I'd like to read you a very simple little passage, very short, from Exodus. Some scholars say that these couple of lines are amongst the very oldest in Scripture, from a very ancient tradition oral tradition. Miriam the prophetess, Aaron's sister, and, and Moses' sister, took up a timbrel, and all the women followed her with timbrels, or tambourines, dancing, and Miriam led them in the refrain, singing, Sing of Yahweh, he has covered himself in glory, horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. And that's it, just those couple of lines later made into a long, epic um, song. Just sing of Yahweh, he's covered himself in glory, he's drowned the gods of Egypt and their minions in the sea, in the waters of our passing through, the waters of our baptism, if you like, into a new life, the waters of our freedom, has drowned the gods of Egypt, the gods of slavery and oppression. So hey, rejoice. It's important to say that this exodus takes place in a community. It's not just done alone. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the talk. So I want to ask now, consider now with you, how is it that we heard the call? How does it come to us, this call of liberation? How is it experienced? How did we, how did we come to realize that we were in slavery? And also, what is it that makes it worth the insecurity, the struggle, the pain, the alienation, the loss of so much of our lives and our sense of self 
as we come out. And I stress again that I'm talking both about coming out within to our souls and to our God, however we image God, and coming out in a more public sense. And I do believe that for different people at different times, those two things are appropriate. Um, personally, I believe absolutely that we are all called gradually in our journey to a public coming out, however and whenever that takes place. And I really do believe that can be incarnated for different people in different ways. I have absolutely no doubt that every single one of us is called to come out inside, to come out to ourselves, to own who we are, and to own that in the presence of our God, and hear the words of letting go of freedom, of acceptance, of promise, addressed to us as gay and lesbian people. And until that has happened, no amount of coming out publicly is true coming out, is true freedom. It's the gods within that keep us in slavery, that are the true slavery. So how does this, this awakening, how does, this, how does this, this call come? I just gave you the word. It, it comes as an awakening, a waking up. And this is a core concept in all understandings of the spiritual life. Buddha is supposed to have been asked once, by someone, are you a god? And Buddha said, I'm awake. I'm awake. That's the answer. To wake up. And when one is awake, the rest of life, and our, as it was lived, is like, a, a sl like sleep, like being in a coma, like being in a closet, shut in, unable to smell the daisies unable to breathe the fresh air, unable to hug and embrace ourselves and one another. So this awakening, in contemplative life, in spiritual life, there are two awakenings, before the exodus and after the exodus. Before the exodus, before the moving out, and I think of the pattern of, of those early monks leaving the cities as, as a great pattern of spiritual life, there's an awakening of spiritual joy what before was um, routine and, and words suddenly comes alive with juice and, and beauty and suddenly um, the words of scripture just set us on fire and we experience the sweetness, you know, taste and see that God is good. We experience this. It's like, my God, this is, this is real, this is alive. I can taste it, the juice, the sweetness. And the other side of that, and there's always another side, as you may have gathered, is awakening to the deadness, to the routine, to the numbness, to the hypocrisy, to the double dealing, both within myself and around me. We can't be blind to it any longer. Now that sets us on the journey. I think that sets us on the exodus in the spiritual life. And you know, there's, there's pain and there's dryness and there's joy and there's compromise and there's freedom and there's struggle and somehow we come out, somehow we leave. And for these early monks, it was leaving the cities in a very literal sense. For many of us, it's a different kind of leaving. It's like a it's like true conversion of heart. When we actually do choose different gods, you know, up until now we've been struggling, and somehow at this point we do choose different gods. And, and it is a leaving of the old gods, the old values, the old ways we named our lives and ourselves. And we come out and we discover the most beautiful thing, the fresh air, that there is a new life on the other side that we hardly dreamed about. And for me personally, this happened a number of years ago when after teaching for 13 years, I literally dropped out and went and lived on the beach for a year. And it mixed, mixed all the pain and, and the loneliness and the shit of that year. There was this fresh air. There is a life here that I hardly knew existed. Hidden. Which you only taste when you come out, when you leave. That's the second awakening. And the downside of it, the deeper downside, is there is no way back. Once you've tasted this life, you ain't never going back. And it's not always beautiful, it's not always wonderful, 
at times you think you're crazy and you've just lost it and you ought to chuck all this and go and get a proper job um, but have a proper life, make some real money as my mother said, um, find a, a real husband, wife, children, home, mortgage, whatever. And by the way, this new life can be found in the midst of all of those if we're truly free. For me, it wasn't. For those early monks, it wasn't. But hey, this is life. This is freedom. This is fresh air. Why would I go back there? And being true to that is part of the struggle. And there'll be more exoduses and more struggles and more freedoms, more goings out. But, but these two are core. The awakening to spiritual joy and the awakening to a new life on the other side of exodus. And sometimes it's gradual and sometimes it's an earthquake. And in fact, an earthquake is a good image of it. There's this movement under, under the ground. The plates are uh, grinding and the tension's building. And then there's this slip and we're on the other side. We only got there by all this gradual grinding and struggle and, and then this freedom. So the earthquake is a good image for that. And sometimes we're aware of the earthquake and sometimes we're aware of the grinding and the struggle that leads up to it. But you need them both. I want to compare these two awakenings in the spiritual life with two awakenings for gay people. I love this part. Firstly, it's the awakening that our sexual desires are okay. That it's all right to love men, to be turned on by men. That it's all right, if we're lesbian, to be turned on by women. It's okay. It's maybe even good, maybe even good, maybe the possibility that it could be good. And we actually start to feel this and start to own the fact that I do feel this. I do get turned on by men. And hey, that's all right. My God, what a transition. After all the shit that's been loaded on us, for one poor, scared, frightened person to say, it's okay, that little voice. I mean, God, that's leaping mountains to be able to say that in our society. So that's the first awakening. The downside of it is that we feel more deeply the pain and the contradiction of feeling what we've been told we're not to feel and that we've taken on. And that's the downside. We feel that far more acutely. And we feel the fear and the uncertainty that we're stepping outside the bounds. We're crossing over. We're breaking the law. And that's scary. I refer back to my, my story in the first session of, of both feeling the joy of a sexual encounter and feeling that everything in me wanted to say this was bad, but I knew it wasn't. And, and the wrench of that, that's part of the pain of this awakening. The second awakening, which is in some ways far more profound, but can't happen unless the first one happens, is the awakening of sexuality as holy, as grace, as divine, as saturated with the love and the presence of God. The realization this is not just good and okay, this is sacred. This is the way into the divine itself. This is the love of God coming to meet me, coming alive in me. This is not just all right. This is divine. And to be in the life of God is to live fully with this. This is the second awakening. This is the true and deepest awakening. And after this, there is no turning back. There is no turning back. We have really gone through the waters. I'd like to recite a poem for you that I think expresses this very beautifully. And it's a poem that I wrote when this first happened for me. The first time I was with another man and felt in my guts the holiness of this, which would not be denied. And I'd like you perhaps to close your eyes or to go within yourself and to, to hear this in your own experience. We have built a fire in the black fireplace tonight. 
to change. Its fingers laugh at the logs we pile on, wet from the night. Your shoulders are strong like mine. Your chin line clean, warm stone. I run my fingers along the grain. I feel firm thigh muscles soften under the denim sacrament beside me. I taste the wine and wonder at the chalice. A sip of port and gentle song we kiss. Genuflecting fingers, reverent and wondrous tongues. I lay my head on the dark cliffs of your chest and feel the waves beating in your blood your arms like warm curves of land close around me. And deep in my body, my belly, up rushes a sea full song, and I can only lay and let its tongues, its waves break through me like surf, like clean cold flames tingling with God who holds my body in his. At rest now. At rest now. The name lingers on my lips and I still taste the night I held the beating, licking body of God and felt the blood of praise surge and tumble through me, the wake of God's love. When we come through this holy awakening or it happens within us, there is no longer any desire to go back, any need to go back, or any possibility of going back. We are on the other side of the Red Sea. We have gone through our baptism, often a baptism of blood, certainly a baptism of tears, and a baptism of joy. And a baptism that takes place in our bodies, in our bodies in our flesh. I don't know, maybe there are ways, but I don't know of ways to go through this baptism without it happening in our bodies. I do think of two stories I heard of two different priests for whom this happened when they were at prayer, one of them when he was actually celebrating the Eucharist and found himself aroused with a raging heart on and felt the holiness and the bodily involvement of what he was doing in the Eucharist and in his own body. Perhaps that's another way of going through this holy awakening. Certainly, the understanding or the image of having loving and erotic sex with Christ, making love to Christ, is an experience that a number of gay men have told me about as their first deep realization that this is holy. This is a way into union with the divine lover, this physical, sexual, erotic experience of spiritual and sexual joy, spiritual and sexual lovemaking as one reality. Now, what's happening here is that we are tasting for ourselves what all the institutions talk about, what the institution of the church, what all the scripture tries to, um, to minister to us, to be a channel for us. We're tasting it ourselves. And brothers and sisters, we are tasting it outside the bounds. Outside the bounds that we have been told we must not exceed. And that outside those bounds, 
There is only sin. There is only death. Well, hey, we've been there. We've been there and we know different. Outside those bounds is life, is grace, is joy, is God, is the divine lover himself, herself. And this makes us dangerous because we're tasting it now ourselves. We don't need in the same way the channels of, of grace, the structures of the church or society because now we are tasting freedom ourselves in our own guts. And we are never going to be the same again. So we're dangerous people. And hallelujah for the danger we are to society and the church. The downside, we see the oppression for what it is. We see the slavery for what it is. We see the cruelty and the evil for what they are. We now know what is being done to us and our brothers and sisters in the name of God. And that is intensely painful. It's the downside. So things are moving. We're on the road. We've crossed the Red Sea and we are really, truly free. Not totally. Not totally. Those gods still pursue us because they're in us. But we're, we're really free now. We are living a life. We are living a life. And you can perhaps see why I'm saying so strongly that this coming out, this exodus, this liberation is both within and external. Most crucially, it's within. If, by some miracle of the Holy Spirit, people are actually able to remain fully in the institution, and I know some people who claim they are, and who am I to tell them what their truth is? I don't claim to do that. But I do believe if they can, it's a miracle of the Holy Spirit. They will be in the institution in a totally different way. They will not be the same person. They will not be the same member of the institution. They are now dangerous. They are now subversives. They are now spies, if you like, sent out to prepare the new kingdom, the new land, the new freedom, even within the institution. So they are free as well. So things are moving. There's rejoicing, but there's still the pain of leaving behind the old life and all that we knew. There's still uncertainty. There's still an unknowing of, as to where this is going to lead us. Where the hell is this going to lead us? What does this promise mean? We've, we've come this far, but we can't see all that will happen ahead of us. We're aware of the baggage we still carry. We're aware more than ever of the bewilderment and the opposition of others. And we're aware that there are still deaths and exoduses to come. It's not over yet. Remember Carter Haywood talking about how when she came out publicly on radio, I think it was, or, or perhaps in, a, in a, a newspaper article, she thought, oh, I've done it now, the world knows. Little realising that you know, every time she met someone, every time she gave a talk, every time someone else said, oh, you're Carter, Carter Haywood, there was the issue of, do I come out again and again and again and again? The exodus has to keep on being made. And it's not easy. It's never easy. Especially since we become more and more aware of just how much is against us. So this essential movement to life begins both in a sense of emptiness and slavery and in the awakening to new possibilities, to joy, to freedom, which shows us our slaveries, slavery and promises, promises us new life, a new way of being. And this, this is very typical in the contemplative life, the spiritual life, and in gay and lesbian life. The parallels continue. In contemplative life, this joy very quickly gives way to aridity, to dryness in prayer, to a sense of boredom, and pointlessness. We'll talk about more in the next session. In gay life, this gives way, this joy gives way to this feeling of this is a hard road, this is not an easy road to walk. And when we realize this, when we've gotten over the dance of joy with the timbrels and the tambourines and the singing as we come through the water of Exodus, when we get over that, then we're really on the journey. Just a word in closing about community. And I can't say this too strongly. 
The Exodus was a community event. And in the experience of passing through the water and then passing through the desert, it was that experience that made this group of motley people, these nomads and wanderers and slaves, it was that that made them into a people. But they experienced it together, together. The desert monks, even though they went out into the desert alone, they very soon formed hermitages around one another to find support, to find some guidance from the older monks who lived the road longer. Not too many of them continued to go out and be totally alone. They found community. But Brian McNaught, a wonderful um, teacher and guide in, in this coming out process, says that until you have a community of support, don't do it. Now I think too of the wonderful story of, of the raising of Lazarus, when Jesus goes to the tomb of his friend who's been dead four days, and in spite of what everyone tells him, he orders that the tomb be opened. And he stands there and calls on the Spirit of God and says to Lazarus, come out. I heard that story at the Eucharist one night when I was going through my own coming out process. And it's, it's you know, always been very precious to me. But the next thing he says when Lazarus comes out, all bound up with the, the, the cloths of death, read you know, what we've been bound up with in our slavery, he says to the people around him, Jesus says to the people around him, unbind him and let him go free. Lazarus needed a community to take off the binds, the bonds, the the stuff that clung to him and kept him in something like death. And we as gay and lesbian people coming out need a community to do that for us. How rarely do we really find that community? This is one of the most desperate needs to form not just any gay community. As Joe Kramer says, there isn't a gay community, there's a gay population. Amen. What we need is true community that will really be with us in this process, in this journey, take off the bonds and lead us in a new way of being. And here I can't say too much about the need for people to make the journey ourselves, the need for mentors, for guides, for people who have the guts to go all the way, to go through all the exoduses, all the deaths and resurrections, all the dyings and rising to new life that we have to go to as mature, truly spiritual gay and lesbian people. Why is it so vital? Because very, very soon, the newly out gay person will go into the desert very quickly. And we'll talk about that more in the next tape. They will very soon encounter the cost. And we have no natural community. No family, no tribe, no nation, no religious order of our own. No, no one's going to set up a, a, a separate country for us, although I hear some gay groups are starting to lobby for that. Well, good luck to them. I'm pleased to see they chose Hawaii as one of the, the main possible locations for this new country. If they get it, perhaps I'll go and become a citizen. But it's unlikely. Currently, we have none. So we have no natural community. At least, you know, a, a young black person coming out I mean, and, and, and coming out into freedom can find some sense of nurturance, some sense of solidarity with other black people also on the journey and who've gone before him. Too few of us have that kind of community, that kind of family to go back to, to find nurturance in. And we desperately need it. And also because we have been cut off from our sources of wisdom. We've been cut off from our spiritual heritage of, of the scripture and told that it is something which condemns us and it's been used as something to bash us and kill us. So we've been cut off from the wisdom of scripture and the heritage of the Christian community. And this is what I'm trying to recover. And we've been cut off from our gay heritage, from the heritage, for example, of the two spirits tradition, so-called Burdash, well that's not a, a word we ought to use anymore, but the two spirits of the Native American traditions, from the wisdom of gay elders and gay shamans in all kinds of traditions throughout the world, we've been cut off from them as well. 
And too many of our old people are caught too much in the web of trying to be what the so-called gay community tells us we ought to be, endlessly seeking youth, for example, instead of the wisdom which comes with age, which can then be offered back to us as we grow. Not to condemn those people, to just recognise the sadness of what slavery does to us and how we need, we need to also minister to our older people and encourage them to own their wisdom and their experience. So there's this desperate need for gay community. And we will encounter both hostility from the church, who are supposed to be an agency to, to lead us into freedom, and from some gay people who do not want us to take this journey either, who would prefer us to remain as slaves who have sex but have it in the closet. No one ever said you can't have sex in the closet. You just can't have freedom. So I want to say that the gay person who tries to live as an open, mature, fully spiritual human being will find his sanity, his or her sanctity, and his or her life as much at threat as any hermit in any Syrian desert, as any monk in any desert. So we need each other. Discernment around coming out, around how we're being led into this exodus, look for our points of resistance. Look for the desert roads. Look for the, the moments where we feel the need to move, where we feel the slavery chafing, where we feel the plates grinding, when we feel the sense that there is more. So let's go forward. Let's go forward with the pillar of fire of our passion and the pillar of cloud, the sense of mystery, of possibility, of the unknown, to guide us and to encourage us. We have nothing to lose but our chains and our slavery. And what we gain is our lives. Leave your family, your country and your father's house for the land that I will show you.